Good afternoon and welcome to the CPCI 5th edition Design Manual Chapter 5 webinar presentation. Uh, my name is Ariane Sabourin and I am the Marketing Manager for CPCI. I'd like to take um, a moment to thank everyone for joining us for today's webinar session. Our presenter today is Malcolm Hackborn, President of ME Hackborn Engineering and Editor of Chapter 5 of the CPCI Design Manual. Today's webinar presentation will focus on the major changes and additions to Chapter 5, Architectural Precast Concrete. Uh, before we start the presentation, uh, CPCI would like to acknowledge the support of our sponsors of the Design Manual webinar series. So thank you to the following companies, BASF, MCM Industrial Consultants, JVI Inc., and Ultraspan. It is this type of support from our members that assures CPCI can continue to deliver high quality programs and services such as this and to build on our body of knowledge for the architecture, engineering and construction industry. Today's webinar will be about 45 minutes in length. Uh, participants will be muted from the discussion, but you are more than welcome to type in any questions that you might have in the Q&A box that is on your screen. And these questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. Uh, I would also like to mention that attendees will receive a certificate of completion after the webinar, uh, which can be used for uh, your professional development hours. We are also recording the session today and we will make it available on CPCI's website. Um, so without further ado, I will now turn it over to Malcolm for the presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, yes, we'll go through uh, a number of a number, number of topics for the uh, presentation. We'll cover a little bit of introduction on precast, some of the design objectives, the design considerations, aesthetic and building envelope considerations, veneer faced elements, and precast concrete used as forms. Precast has been in use for the last 100 years as a building material and as an architectural cladding for the last 60 years. It has gained more and more acceptance as a suitable building cladding material in the last 40 years. Recently, there has been a, an emphasis on modularization and prefabrication in buildings, materials, and structures, and precast fits well into this niche. Precast is also a durable and sustainable material, which help, has helped it gain significant traction in today's current construction marketplace. There are significant long-term economic benefits to precast due to its durability and speed of construction. There are very few materials that can match the design flexibility of precast in its variety of available colors, finishes, textures, and shape possibilities. There are many tools on the CPCI website that can assist designers in the use of architectural precast in their designs. The design objectives of the precast have to be consistent with those of the overall project. The precast designs have to be serviceable, reducing sharp corners, susceptible to chipping, provide proper exposure resistance, et cetera, and be functional both from a building performance standpoint from an, and from an installation perspective. To gain the economic benefits of precast, there has to be a concerted effort to achieve repetitive panels, and the finishes have to be achievable with readily available local materials and workmanship. The long-term economic benefits of precast come from its durability and the quality inherent in the precast as it is produced in a plant controlled environment. To design precast efficiently, the designer has to consider a number of factors regarding the precast panels. Panel configuration, panel function, panel performance in terms of building envelope functions, longevity, building de or panel design for imposed loads, and panel size all factor into an efficient design. Panel size is determined by a number of factors and the size will dictate how the panels are connected to the structure. Other questions to ask are, how will the panels move relative to the structure? What type of finish is desired for the project? Can local precasters produce this type of finish with uniformity? What type of architectural features does the owner and the designer want for this structure as far as ribs, reveals, cornices, etc., are concerned? Are there other building science requirements that have to be considered, such as in pools, arenas, hospitals, clean rooms, et cetera? Will the panels be window units? How many window openings will be in each panel? Will the windows be installed in the plant prior to shipment to the site? Will the panel span from column to column or cover the columns with small spandrels in between? Be spandrels with rows of windows above or below or solid panels or a combination of all of the above? 
Most structures have a number of panel configurations, but the majority will be one type or another, depending on the portion of the building they are covering. There are two main types of panels for function, non-load bearing and load bearing. Non-load bearing panels act as cladding panels. These panels separate the built environment from the natural environment. Cladding panels resist wind loads, seismic loads, and the panel weight self-weight. If non-load bearing panels are removed, they should have little effect on the stability or integrity of the structure. Load bearing panels may also act as cladding panels, but they also transfer loads from other elements like floor slabs, provide shear resistance, and if they are removed, they have an effect on the stability and integrity of the structure. Non-load bearing panels must be designed to resist the loads mentioned earlier, but usually the strength is governed by stripping loads as the panels are removed from the forms when the concrete is of lower strength and the panels are usually stripped in a flat orientation, so the panels have to resist self-weight and form suction. Deflection concerns arise when panels are used as small spandrels with a number of panels placed along a beam. As the beam deflects, the panels rotate and can combine and can bind in the upper corners. This situation normally occurs when used as part of a window wall system. It is therefore better to use long panels spanning column to column instead of a number of horizontally placed panels if panel weights are an issue, but best if they can be <clears throat> one large panel spanning from column to column. The choice is dependent upon, upon the design of the supporting structure. These long panels can then be supported close to the columns with little influence from slab deflection. Non-load bearing column covers are used to achieve architectural expression. They can be as simple or as complex as the architect wishes. They can also provide significant fire ratings and are readily insulated to provide the required thermal performance. Column covers can also be used for a chase for services such as utilities and rainwater leaders. They are usually supported on the floor slabs or on either side of the column. The design of load bearing panels is dependent on many factors such as panel size, shape, configuration, as well as building layout. They are designed as free bodies isolated from the structure. They are also classified as flat panels or rib panels. Both flat and rib panels can be designed with openings for windows, doors, and mechanical services, etc. There are two types of panels. Single width panels are normally shipped without insulation from the manufacturer. These are lighter in weight than, than the double width panels. Double width panels already contain insulation within the panel withes. They can be designed as non-composite or composite panels. Non-composite panels exhibit less thermal bowing than composite panels, but have less strength than their composite version. Composite panels have greater strength as both wires act together to behave like an eye section. When both wires act together, they provide greater strength and provide for a more efficient design by allowing the use of thinner wires. Single wire panels are commonly referred to as conventional or architectural precast panels. They vary in thickness from three and a half to six inches in typical non-load bearing cladding applications to over 10 inches as load bearing panels, depending on the height of the structure and the loadings applied to the panels. Insulation is normally applied to the inside of the panels once they are installed to meet the thermal requirements of the building. This type of panel only carries the internal loads of the panels itself. Double wife panels have been referred to as sandwich panels, insulated panels, or integrally insulated panels in the past. They consist of two wives or layers of concrete with a layer of insulation in between. They can be designed as non-composite or composite with the advantages as noted earlier. There has been considerable discussion regarding the use of an airspace or drainage layer within this type of panel. The airspace in this type of panel is only required when you use a porous material for the entire exterior wither layer. Standard insulated panels need no special curing. The thermal performance of the panels is dependent upon the insulation type and the insulation thickness. Panels have been designed for R values in excess of 40, which was eight inches of uh, extruded polystyrene, but new insulation types um, have allowed the uh, R values to increase to almost 100. When choosing insulation types, 
never use aluminum foil faced insulation as aluminum and concrete react to produce hydrogen and this can have significant consequences. If the panels are designed as non-composite panels, a bond breaker is required to ensure the concrete does not bond to the insulation. The panel thickness and consequently the panel weights are dependent upon cover requirements, the surface finish and relief features, as well as strength and handling requirements. Normally a 50 millimeter thickness of concrete is adequate to provide an effective vapor barrier. Given the properties of concrete, a one inch thickness of uncracked concrete is equivalent to a layer of six mil poly with one significant difference. You can push a nail through a layer of six mil poly, but would be hard pressed to push a nail through an inch of concrete. When an airspace is provided in panels, the tension compression tie is holding the inner and outer withes together and the shear ties used to keep the panel withes in proper location must be stainless steel. The airspace in panels, when required, is normally created using drainage mat or dimple board. The problem with the airspace is compartmentalization and pressure equalization. Once you introduce an airspace throughout the panel, you have to somehow compartment, compartmentalize this airspace and also the joints around the perimeters of the panels. Drainage mat is difficult to compartmentalize. The other concern is the amount of air that must enter and exit this airspace throughout the panel to effectively pressurize, pressure equalize this cavity. And thus, air entering and exiting the space will carry far more water into the cavity than it is required to drain. In non-composite panels, one wythe, usually the inner structural wythe, supports the exterior wythe. The two wides are joined together with tension compression ties spaced approximately every two to four square feet depending on the tie design and the size and configuration of the panel. Shear ties are required to carry the weight of the supported wythe. These must be provided in two orthogonal directions if the panels are shipped in an orientation that is different than the final orientation on the building. The non-composite panel is analyzed with no interaction between the wythes. Composite panels may be designed as partially composite or fully composite. However, the degree of composite action is very difficult to determine. In composite panels, both wise act together to provide a much stiffer and stronger panel. To achieve this composite action, shear and tension compression ties are required throughout the panel. With composite panels, the deformation of one wythe affects the other wythe. To counteract this, Pre-stressing is common, and this can also reduce some of the thermal bowing effects. Panel size is determined by a number of factors. The load limitations of the structure, such as type of structure, concrete is stiffer than steel, deflection criteria for the structure, and the panels, the location of panel loadings on the structure, and also the magnitude of these loads. The stability of the structure can also affect the loading on the structure, and hence panel size. Plant production capacity may also affect panel size, such as clearances below bridge cranes, door opening sizes, crane capacities, and available form sizes. Transportation limitations can also control panel size. Trailer size, such as length, width, bed height, as well as wheel configuration. Load limits, seasonal load limits, overhead clearances on the route to the project site, and width, re width restrictions will also dictate panel size. Panel size can also be governed by erection capabilities at the site. These can be limited by crane type, size and reach, as well as job site access, the provision of a staging area, panel rotation requirements, pick point location, maneuvering space, and the final position of the panels on the structure. Panel articulation. This refers to the method of attachment to the structure, type of connections used, as well as panel orientation. There should only be one fully fixed connection of, on a panel, otherwise thermal effects will impose additional loads on the connections and the structure. Typical lateral and load bearing connections are shown here. The lateral connection has movement capability in the vertical direction due to the slot in the panel connector. The load bearing connection has adjustment capability in the leveling bolt. When load bearing panels are used, 
There are ways that the loads can be uniformly applied to the panels to not overload one set of panels while not utilizing the others. This way the structure becomes far more efficient and the deflections remain consistent around the structure. Load bearing span spandrels normally support the floor and roof loads of other precast components. These spandrels have to be designed with the same considerations as load bearing panels, as well as the effects of the members that are framing into them. This means the magnitudes of the loads are usually much greater. The eccentric loading of the members framing into the spandrels can impart significant torsional effects on the members. When spandrel panels are loaded with an eccentricity to the main axis of the member, it can induce torsional effects that must be designed for and also accommodated in the adjacent systems. These torsional effects apply additional loads to the supporting structure. Deflection of the building frame due to st structure loadings can distort the building frame. This can cause binding at panel corners, which may cause cracking and spalling, as well as overloading of the connections. Deflection of the structure at supports can cause rotation of the panels and require multiple adjustments to the connections as the members deform. This is especially critical at double cantilevers. The aesthetic and building envelope requirements of projects vary widely depending on the owner's and the architect's need for expression and the climate where the building is located. Concrete is a very versatile construction material as it can be formed into virtually any shape while in its plastic state. This property is not accommodated by many other materials. The architectural details are very dependent on, upon the scale of the project and other site considerations such as the local architecture of the neighborhood. Architectural expression can be created through the use of reveals, false joints and real joints, as well as corners, cornices and feature bands. The colors and textures of the precast is a decision the architect must make, and this decision can have a dramatic effect on the final appearance of the structure. The aggregate color and aggregate size, along with the matrix color and finishing technique, will all have an impact on the appearance of the building. There are some precautions which must be noted. Precast is made of natural materials which vary in color, texture, and gradation. All of these, these factors affect the final color and texture as well as the consistency of the, the precast. Some materials are better than others in maintaining a consistent appearance. Acid etching is a premier finish for light exposure as it imparts a very fine texture on the face of the precast. For heavier, sand, heavier finishes, sandblasting is better as it does not require large amounts of acid and as the finish density becomes greater, the finish is more forgiving and more consistent. Exposed aggregate finishes are brighter and easier to repair because the aggregates have only been exposed to a cement retarder and water. A uniform finish is difficult to achieve on lighter finishes, especially on a light sandblast, due to concrete strength and aggregate differences in the concrete. With a light finish, the presence of air or bug holes appear as dark spots due to the shadows in these small holes. Form imperfections are also more noticeable in very light finishes. Many of the variations in finish of precast concrete panels are due to strength differences when the panels are finished differences in curing techniques, variations in temperatures during curing, material variations such as gradation and aggregate size, and variations in the colors of white and gray cement. Veneer face panels provide an additional palette of finishes and colors. These veneers can be natural cut stone, brick, usually thin brick soaps, structural tile and architectural terracotta or ceramic and porcelain tiles. Having the precast backup for these veneers allows the use of thinner veneers and the fabrication of complex multi-plane panels that would be difficult to achieve without the precast backup. When these complex shaped panels are used, the erection is significantly faster and the panels can be installed all year round as there is no curing of adhesives requiring warmer temperatures. As can be seen from this diagram, the complexity can be significant and to assemble this type of panel on site would involve a lot of work for the masons in considerable time, whereas a precast panel can be cast in a few hours and installed in less than an hour. Considerations that may encourage the use of veneer face panels are the complexity of the units, the properties of the, veneer, the veneers, 
and the compatibility of the materials. Whether the materials will be bonded to the precast depends on the expansion properties of the materials relative to the properties of the precast concrete. When the properties are different, bond breakers are required. Effective bond breakers are polyeth polyethylene plastic sheet, polyethylene foam pad, or an air gap, although the air space is very difficult to achieve as the veneers are in the face of the panels, and that is the bottom as cast face, and the airspace is required behind or on top of the veneer. The airspace and veneers panels is only required when the outer width of the panel is entirely veneer, and when the veneer is very porous, such as with brick or limestone. The structural properties of the veneer material, as well as the proposed veneer anchoring system, will determine the size of the, the veneer slabs and the joint sizing. Some veneers will exhibit differing behaviors with variations in exposure and veining orientation. The size of the veneer pieces, along with the color and veneer materials, can also affect the retaining clip spacing and layout. Any new veneer materials will require extensive testing and sampling to, to determine their suitability for these applications. With any new or variable materials, mock-ups are highly recommended. Precast used, can also be used as stay-in-place forms for buildings. With precast, the architect can determine the shape, form, and finish of the project from the many finishes available with precast. Precast forms allow the inspection of the building finish at an early date with no need for zoom booms and the like, as it can be viewed on the ground prior to installation. The structural engineer can use the precast form sections to contribute to the building sections. This allows for structural continuity and enhances ductility of the structure in seismic zones. The use of precast forms also reduces construction time as it saves form work erection and removal time when large completed units are used. Projects where precast was used as forms are the Toronto City Hall and the Vancouver Public Library. The main design parameters for precast panels are structural performance and environmental performance, such as the thermal performance. The precaster must produce precast erection drawings to convey to the architect their understanding of the project. These are sent in for review along with the connection details for the structural engineer to review. Once these are reviewed and returned to the precaster, anchor layout drawings are prepared and submitted for review. While these are in for approval, the panel production drawings are started, hardware details are prepared, and panel handling procedures and details are prepared. Production considerations include the former materials, whether wood, steel, fiberglass, or special materials, the type of form such as envelope forms, wedge up, or conventional forms. The plant size and its capabilities are also considerations such as mixer capacity, floor space, crane lifting capacities, and the overhead clearances for the cranes. All of these factors will determine the maximum panel sizes and the ability of the plant to produce the precast for the project. Once in production, hardware and reinforcement placement and concrete placement will be the controlling factors as well as curing of the precast to attain stripping strengths. Once the precast is cured, then the stripping, finishing, and storage of the panels will be, have to be considered. Precast is normally produced indoors in a controlled environment so production can continue year round. Quality control measures are fairly stringent as precasters must adhere to CPCQA quality requirements, which were the formerly CPCI quality control plan, the PCI standards, or the NPCA requirements. There is a re legal requirement in Canada that all precast used in buildings must comply to the Canadian codes. And one of those requirements is it must be certified precast. Architects and owners are advised to visit various precaster facilities to view the variety of finishes and textures available with precast concrete and the capabilities of the different precasters. It is recommended that a precaster be brought in early on a project as a precaster can advise as to finish availability and the capabilities of the local precasters. Place value on this assistance as the precaster will have spent considerable time developing the project with you and although his price 
may be higher in tender, he will understand the project better than the other precasters and is less likely to claim extras. Have the precaster review the specifications prior to tendering to ensure there are no loopholes. The tendering process will be a good check to ensure the precaster is giving you a reasonable price. When the project is tendered, ensure the contract is complete. It is better to wait a week or two to, to complete the package than to go out early with an unfinished tender and set of drawings. When the tender or drawings are incomplete, there are questions for the precaster and therefore his price will be higher to allow for the unknown. When the project is awarded, review the tenders to ensure they are complete. If they are not complete, disqualify the bid and move on to the next bid. Be open to the bidders, be tough, but be fair. Everyone will benefit in the end. Once you have decided on a precaster, check their references and review previous projects for uniformity, color and texture, as well as the project performance. Get samples of the colors you are looking for from the precaster. If they cannot produce the samples to your liking, maybe the color is not a good choice. Start with your color samples like paint chips. 300 by 300 will give a good representation of the color and texture achievable. Once a color is decided upon, have the precaster produce range samples, which are one meter by one meter or 1200 by 1200. Due to their size, these will be cast with plant produced concrete. Once the range samples are approved, look to have a mock-up produced to ensure the details on the panels are what was intended. If the configuration of the precast and windows or other adjoining materials is new, have a performance mock-up made to verify that the configuration will perform as intended. Have the precaster make patching samples to prove that the precaster can patch to your satisfaction. Allow plenty of time for samples, design, drawing preparation and fabrication on the precast. Production is usually limited to 10 to 15 panels per day for a specific project. Do not expect uncracked panels, concrete cracks. Expect to see fine higher line cracks and accept them. But this does not mean you have to accept large cracks in panels. Remember, <clears throat> panels are large and heavy. When the wind grabs a panel, it is going to move and it is difficult to stop it once it is moving. Chips are going to happen. Use only the best sealant material available. The weak link in a precast system is the sealant. For a typical project worth $50 million, the precast caulking would rep represent less than 1% of the overall project cost, so less than $500,000. The sealant material is usually less than 20% of this cost, so less than $100,000. If the best sealant available is worth double the price of the least expensive sealant, the additional cost would be approximately $100,000. The least expensive sealant will provide a five-year warranty and the best will provide a 25-year warranty. Based on these numbers, the five-year sealant will cost $500,000 and the best will cost $600,000. Looking at the sealant costs as a yearly cost, the least expensive sealant will cost the owner $100,000 per year, and the most expensive sealant will cost the owner $24,000 a year. The other consideration is that the reapplication of the sealant will be at least double the original application as the old has to be removed and the sealant reapplied. It is also very difficult to change sealant types once the original has reached its life expectancy. There are a number of publications available for use on the CPCI website. Some of these are listed here. Go to the cpci.ca website to download your copies. Great, um, thank you for this uh, very informative presentation, Malcolm. Uh, please mark your calendars for the upcoming webinar presentations. The next one for Chapter 6 on Related Considerations will be held uh, next Wednesday, September 19th at 1 p.m. Eastern. And you see the other um, presentation dates um, listed there on your screen. Uh, and you can register online for the webinars at cpci.ca under the resource section. And there is a page there called Design Manual. Uh, so I'd like to thank our Design Manual um, webinar series sponsors once again for their support of these series. 
uh, BASF, MCM Industrial Consultants, JVI Inc., and Ultraspan. So at this time, I would like to open it up for questions. If you have any questions for our presenter, you can type them in the um, Q&A section that is on your screen, and I will turn it over to Malcolm again. Okay, I've got a question. Why would you use non-composite double width panels if the composite panels are lighter and stronger? Well, one of the big concerns with uh, composite panels is thermal bowing. So um, if you have panels that come up to a corner, you have uh, bowing in two um, what, directions normal to one another. And so the, the uh, sealant within that joint will be working against itself um, in both directions. A second question is, what would typical lead time be for a precast condominium project? So normally you'd uh, look at a, um, a tender period of four weeks, two weeks for the architect owner to evaluate the, the tender and award it, um, anywhere from six to 10 weeks to prepare precast shop drawings, another two weeks, hopefully, maybe a little more for uh, architect re to review. And this also depends on the complexity of the project. It may take longer. Um, um, say another four, four to six weeks to prepare production drawings and get them into production, prepare forms, etc. cetera. Um, normally, as I said earlier, 10 to, say 10 to 15 panels per day, um, typical condominium can have as many as 600 to 800 panels, so another 8 to 12 weeks of production. And uh, so just to the end of production would mean somewhere in the order of 9 to 12 months. Erection will happen about 6 to 10 panels per day. So um, if you look at 600, that's 100 days or um, 20 weeks. But some of those weeks can be nested um, in the uh, production time frame. So I would say probably minimum would be a year. The question was, how do you contact a precaster to get design assistance with the project? Um, normally I would um, suggest you contact CPCI. You can go to their website and find out um, the name and contact information of precasters. Um, you can also uh, call up CPCI, uh, Brian Hall, Ariane, or uh, Ariane Severin, or Rob Burak, and they can give you some uh, names of precasters in your local area. Another question, if I have problems with the precast on a project, how can I get the issues resolved to everyone's satisfaction? So to get the uh, precast issues resolved, if it's a, a CPCI member producer that the precast was um, obtained from, CPCI will um, get behind you and the precaster and try to resolve the issues between, between the two of you. If it's a non-CPCI producer, really they have no power to um, step in. They can give you some suggestions. They can probably um, refer you to a consultant who could do the, um, like do an evaluation, hopefully at arm's length that uh, you could find out whether it, you're barking up the wrong tree or whether you have legitimate concerns. Um, CPCI members represent about 85% of the precast that's made in Canada. So most precast produced is produced in uh, Canada is produced by CPCI members. So it's a good chance you'll, you'll have a um, CPCI member producer. The other thing is if you've specified CPCA, CPCQA uh, certification for the project. This is the new Canadian Precast Concrete uh, Quality Assurance Program. Um, all of the CPCI members um, must be CPCQA certified. 
Okay. Um, I don't see any other questions at this time. So that uh, concludes the Q&A session and the presentation for today. Uh, thank you again for joining us. And of course, thank you to our presenter, Malcolm. Um, if you have any questions uh, for CPCI, you are welcome to contact us at info at cpci.ca. And thank you and have a wonderful afternoon.